everyone, so I'm back with another Q&A video because there's a question that's been coming up frequently enough that it felt like it was something worth putting a video out about instead of repeating myself over and over. And it's a pretty fair and important question, so that's why I'm doing this. And that question is, why did we pick the RV-10? I know I talked before in another video about kind of like how we got into the idea to build our own plane, but I don't think I really talked too much about like why this one. So that's what I'm going to try and go over a little bit today and kind of go through our thought process and what else we considered and what led us to landing on the RV-10. So I'm going to go over a couple of the different other planes that we looked at, why we happen to be looking at those planes, kind of over like a first impressions of what we thought when we checked out those planes, and then some additional features and specs and information we came up with after doing some more research that's what helped lead us to our decision. So as I've mentioned in a previous video, we first got the idea to start building our own plane after going to Oshkosh 2018 and seeing the One Week Wonder that um, was being put on there by Vans and other sponsors where they built the plane in one week. And really getting to like see all that and get into it. And that's what kind of got our, our creative juices going about, like we could, we could do this, right? Maybe? Mm -hmm. So that's what got us to start looking at different planes. And the big thing that we thought we'd want was to have a four passenger plane because for us it was gonna be more about traveling, being able to travel comfortably, being able to travel with our dogs or with family or friends or whatnot. So we were mostly looking at the different four passenger planes. One of the ones that we went and saw out at, um, at Oshkosh was the Lancer Mako. We looked at that one because of looking at the speed and the range and a bunch of the different information about it, but um, first impressions kind of with that one after walking around climbing in, it wasn't for us personally very comfortable. Um, something with like the center console, the way they have it set up is there's one stick and it's in between the two seats and then there's a armrest that's there and I'm sure it's something with that configuration but that center console comes up a little bit higher having the fixed armrest it just didn't feel quite as comfortable um there was other things knowing that like the the design of the plane comes with just one door on the pilot side on the left but you have to pay extra to then have the second door option on the right and the easy entry and everything. Um, and I think it also had kind of like a smaller baggage door, which again, you could pay. There was an ex, uh, I think it was actually that year that they announced it, that they designed this new like extra large baggage door, but it was just kind of, um, it wasn't bad. It's not like there was a bad plane or whatever. It just was something that, um, for us, just again, like first impressions, we weren't super comfortable with it. Another thing after talking to them and learning more about the plane, part of what they require if you do one of their kits is that you have to go and do at a minimum two weeks at their facility in uh, Uvalde, Texas. And again, I think they had like just moved. I think they had just been bought out and had just moved to Texas. Anyway, the point was that you had to go and do at a minimum two weeks to have what they call the crucial components built there. And that was just something again, where it's like, well, so are we going to be taking vacation or time off or two weeks worth of weekends or like, how's this going to work that we're going to end up doing these two weeks there. So it was just something that we we're it, again, none of this was like a definite no at this point. This was just kind of, again, some of the first impressions when we started just hemming and hawing about this stuff. Another plane that we went to go and check out after looking at the Lancer Mako was the Sling TSI. And that one, again, another great plane. But one thing that we noticed when I went to go and get in is that if you look at it, the walls on the side of the cockpit come up higher 
than they do on either the Mako or on the RB10. So what I mean is that the, the doors themselves, those going doors aren't actually as big. It's primarily just like the window area that opens. It's not like the entire large door. And so what that meant was that one, when you're sitting down like the door, even with the door open, the wall then came up to pretty much about your shoulder. And then you kind of had to like step from the wing like into the plane and like stand on the seat and then like kind of slide down into place again it's like this isn't like it's something wrong with the plane it just was something that you know from climbing around and looking around at some of the others just going oh. yeah, it just if personally again this is a personal preference it just kind of felt a little bit weird it just didn't feel really as like super comfortable again they also had like a smaller baggage door and I think at this point maybe like why I was noticing more with the stuff with the doors for the baggage and everything was you know we flew up in the Cessna from or one of the Cessnas from our flying club and you know we had to get all of the camping gear into the Cessna and I was the one like you know crawling <laughs> into the hole and trying to arrange everything in the back and trying to pull out some of these you know bigger bags that we had our clothes or the 10 or whatever and so you know i was probably a little bit more like tuned in to hey what does that baggage door look like because of it um but so that was another thing like just again kind of just like with the whole feel it was nothing again nothing like hugely wrong it was just something i noticed it's like hmm it's kind of you know different having the side come all the way up to here and then having a smaller door and then kind of having to step in and then having the smaller baggage door so after that we went to the Vans area and went to go and check out the Vans RV10 being another one of the four seaters and right away like I really liked the aesthetic it really reminded me of the Cirrus that we had been considering before that when we thought maybe we'll just buy a new or used um, certified plane to have for ourselves instead of building one but getting in and sitting in it it right away after having already gone through the other two just felt really comfortable um it has again like the lower panels on the side so bigger door less just like panel there next to you um it doesn't have the center stick so there was just a little bit more space there in the area between the two seats in the cockpit um it is a little bit of a wider cabin just in general like right away from getting into it it just personally felt a lot more comfortable than getting into the other two there was also some little things where again this one already had the two doors instead of for example like with the mako where you had that was like an add-on and unlike with the mako or the tsi um this one had a much bigger baggage door already uh that felt more comfortable to be getting into and out of so um Again, just for like first impressions right off the bat, it was very appealing to us and felt really comfortable. So I try to kind of explain, I guess, like why I think it was a little bit more comfortable. And you know, comfort is a personal preference thing. This, I think, hopefully will help demonstrate to all of you why I think it's really important to go out and see for yourself, like try and go and uh, it's, I'm sure a little bit difficult now with all the social distancing, but trying to figure out how to go and meet somebody else with the plane, meet one of the vendors, but to go and actually get inside and get a feel for yourself of what it actually feels like in the plane. So that was Oshkosh. That's what we went and saw and climbed around in and just kind of checked out while we were still toying with the idea of building a plane and just wanted to take advantage of the situation. We're sitting here going, if we're here, it's EAA, we should be going and checking out all of the different kits that we might be interested in getting in the future. After we got home and now we are here talking more about it and getting a little bit more serious and um, we still were looking at maybe getting a certified newer used uh, plane but the kept kind of coming back to the kits and really wanting to look into them more and so we went and did some research, well, more research on like the specs and the price and whatnot and started to get more like details for each of the different kits. And keep in mind the prices that I'm going to be mentioning here, those are just for 
the basic kit. So these prices here from each of their different websites does not include quick build, build assist, upgrades. It does not include, very important, this does not include the engine, the prop, the avionics. This is just for the components to build the plane. So that's where these prices are coming from. This is not a fully completed plane for any of these three models with this price. <laughs> so going forward with that, looking at the the Mako, again, this was one where the specs were was really impressive and that's part of what got us there. Looking at the uh, max speed, the cruising speed, the range, um, the useful load and everything, the baggage capacity in the back, all of that was all really very impressive. It can carry 75 gallons of gas and the payload with full fuel is 900 pounds. So that's, you know, four 200 pound adults and 100 pounds of baggage with full 75 gallons of fuel. So that's quite a bit. And according to the specs on their website, it has typical specs of about 190 knots cruising and range of about, I think it was like 1100 nautical miles. So again, really, really impressive. But then here's the kicker. The cost for their kit without, again, any of the engine, avionics, prop, just for their basic kit is $127,000. And that's without any of the other things that we already knew that we'd want, like having the second door on the right side of the plane. And to add the second door, costs 18,000 more dollars. Plus again, like we would have to go and do two weeks over there at their facility, putting it together. And so their estimate for the completed price, um, once you start putting everything else that you need in the plane, engine prop, all that avionics, Minimum, they say about $350,000 up to a half a million dollars. And now when you're talking about up to a half a million dollars, that is going to be a tricked out plane, sure. But still, is like once you get to that half a million dollar mark, we're like, ooh, even at $350,000, it's like, oh, you know, like that's, that's a lot. So... Again, this isn't like it's a bad plane. It's just that when we sat there and looked at what the cost was total for building one of the Lancer Makos, that it just was a lot more expensive than some of the other options that were out there. And for us personally, it wasn't worth the additional performance that we were gonna get for that much additional cost. Looking at the Sling TSI from the Airplane Factory, um, they were much less expensive with their basic kit, again, slow build, no quick build, no build or assist. The total cost on their website coming out to uh, just over $56,000. Uh, again, no engine, no avionics, no prop, uh, just for the kit itself. But so that was substantially less than the 127,000 for um, the Lancer Mako for their, just their kit. And the th thing there though, once we started kind of comparing notes and comparing stats is that when we were comparing it to the RB10, the specs just really weren't as impressive. And so what I mean by that is um, it could only hold like, for example, 45 gallons of fuel with their basic kit. I do believe there is an add-on where you can have extended fuel tanks, but again, I'm just trying to look at comparing just basic, what do we get um, just with each straight at the minimum kit. And um, so it's just the 45 gallons that could carry. Uh, the useful load and everything was less. I think that if you had the max fuel in the plane, you could carry, I think it was 730 pounds, which for a four passenger plane, the thing is that the FAA uh, standard size adult and carry on, I think is 190 to 195 
pounds and so at like 730 pound payload you could carry with full fuel that comes in short by I think it was like 30 or 40 pounds of being able to take four like full-size adults and just carry on bags so that's not even with like baggage baggage and so that was one thing that you know kind of looking at the numbers that was a little bit off-putting um it ran a little slower i think that the um average cruising speed is about 155 knots and um the range was a little bit lower i think it was around like 800 nautical miles um just a couple things like that where it was again this is not i am not trying to knock any of these aircraft this is just trying to kind of go over our thought process and so that was one of the things that we you know noticed is it's like hmm, it just doesn't seem to have quite the same like performance that the rv10 does so now getting to the rv10 um that one right off the bat was less expensive than either of the other two and so for their slow build kit the complete kit to put the plane except again no engine no avionics no prop etc um that one came in at just over forty nine thousand dollars and where that really got our attention beyond the fact that right off the bat we felt more comfortable with the plane it just felt like a better fit for us but then looking at the different specs and what we got for that price tag um it already had better um performance so it had a let's see i believe that the average cruising speed around like 175 knots versus 155 knots 170 to 175 knots yeah and then um versus 155 like we saw for the TSI the uh, it had 60 gallons of fuel that it was capable of carrying really the RV10 kind of landed like right in between the specs for the Mako and the Sling is what we found that this like the Sling it could carry 75 gallons of fuel the no sorry the mako could carry 75 gallons of fuel the sling could carry 45 gallons of fuel the rv10 carries 60. the um mako had a range of i think it's about like 1100 nautical miles the sling had a range of about i think it was 800 nautical miles and then the 10 had a range of around like 900 nautical miles so again kind of falling right there in the middle um the useful load ended up with full fuel coming in at oh i think it was like just over 800 pounds so that did meet enough for like the faa standard adult size with a carry-on bag if you have four at 190 to 195 pounds you know 800 plus um useful load with the full fuel that does work which again worked a lot better for us with the whole primary purpose of wanting to have and build our own plane and trying to kind of do like an apples to apples if you were to put only the 45 gallons into the rv10 that the sling is capable of carrying then that ended up giving you uh even more of your load that you could carry which ended up bringing it i think to just about 900 pounds so now you've got four 200 pound adults and 100 pounds of bags which is a lot more useful for going and trying to do a trip with our dogs or with family or friends. Um, things like that where it just kind of started coming together with the specs. Now, keep in mind too, like I am really condensing a lot of the research that we did. I mean, when we left Oshkosh at the end of July, 2018, we didn't end up actually pulling the trigger on purchasing our kit until March or April of the following year. So we had several months that we were researching online and looking at more information, looking at other build videos, looking at other build logs, trying to look at um, other people's opinions on what they thought and really doing the research. So this is like a really super condensed version. Um, but what the, the crux really kind of came down to for us is that given the, the size, the speed, the range, the comfort, and the cost for the RV10 versus the Mako or the Sling TSI, the RV10 just for us 
and what we wanted it for was a much better fit and um it was also really great to see the whole Vans aircraft community that was in existence. Everything with Vans Air Force, with other forums on Facebook and elsewhere online, other build logs and build videos, and everyone that we had come across was really helpful and really uh, friendly. This is not saying that for either of the other two, they're not. This was just part of the whole process for us about like what kept drawing us towards ending up pulling the trigger on the Vans RV-10. There is a lot of information out there on all three of these planes, and there are people who build and buy all three of these planes. So this is not, you know, saying, oh, poo-poo on these other planes, and, you know, this is no way to go. This is just my attempt to try to answer the question that we've been asked about, like, why did we pick it? Like, what was it about the Vans RV-10 that made us go, this is it, this is the one that we want to have, and this is the one that we want to build. So, you know, go out and I really encourage any of you who are interested in building your own plane to go and do your own research and, you know, really go out and see if you can get into one of the planes and check it out first just to see how you feel and, you know, again, just like do do your own research. Don't just you know get it because I'm I say I like it. Um, it's people buy all of these. You just need to figure out like what is going to be the one that makes you happiest and most comfortable for like the mission that you want to have with your plane that you're going to build. Now, if any of you out there have decided that you want to go and build your own Vans RV and you have found my videos to be useful or helpful or you've just enjoyed them, then I would encourage you to please consider providing Vans with our builder ID, which I'm gonna list in the description below when you purchase your empennage kit. Vans will send me $100 as a thank you and it doesn't cost you any extra, but it does let me know that somebody out there has enjoyed and appreciated and found these videos to be helpful in your decision to purchase your own RV kit. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to give me a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so for more videos like this and to follow along as we build our RV tent.